confiscation of Jewish property was accomplished because of the same spirit displayed when they had willingly and proudly donned the yellow star, not just to comply with the law, but to make it obvious to everyone what good German citizens they were. Warehouses filled up with furniture and valuables seized after people were arrested, and they were then made to sign inventories of their homes and assets to prove that they were not homeless beggars in need of being relocated. And then the Nazis put them onto trains and went back to empty out their houses and distribute their belongings. And at first it had been more of an experiment to see how the neighbors would react, and nobody complained and so it was safe to continue with the agenda, and that's how Jews ended up later in Auschwitz. The worst extermination camps were in Poland and in the East because the Poles were more afraid of the Russians than they were of the Germans, and thus had seen no choice but to go along with, the Na with what the Nazis were doing, and being good Catholics, giving the Jews in Poland a chance to turn from their wicked ways was certainly seen as a blessing. After the war, those who had participated said that any protest would have been only a drop in the bucket, and therefore worthless, and Hannah said that while Jews had been outsiders and devils, the rumors of world conspiracy were new, and that any charity or kindness or tolerance in Germany disappeared. Hannah said that there were two kinds of people, those who were horrified by the extermination of Jews, and those who thought it was tragic, but that they were only Jews, and wasn't it sad what was happening to them, but that science of nature must be allowed to take its course. Berlin Jews were arrested by Jewish policemen, directed to the trains by Jewish organizers, walked into the gas chambers by Jewish capos, and their corpses disposed of by more Jews, and then other Jews had to dig up these dead bodies and try to burn them when the Americans turned the tide of the war. Bruno Bettelheim said it wasn't so much what the Germans did to the Jews that was so bad, but what they did to each other, and that while some behaved like monsters inside the camps, they would say that when they got out, things would be different. Bruno said the lower classes were delighted to be on an equal footing with the rich in the camps, and he said that the campers would daydream about messianic and apocalyptic things, and that they felt they would emerge as leaders after the ashes cooled. Eli Wiesel said that when he got to Auschwitz as a small child, he thought it might be Jerusalem because it was, quote, the ingathering of the exiles, close quote, as Jews were coming from all parts of the diaspora, and so being put into the camps was a great joy because they thought the Messiah would then come to rescue them just as soon as they'd all been gathered together. Muller, as I said before, no one wanted them anywhere. The security service did have connections with the Zionists who wanted Jews in Palestine to help build up their Zionist state. They would take them, but don't forget the British ran Palestine, and the Arabs there did not want any Jews at all. They all complained to Ribbentrop, who in turn ran to Hitler and said the SS was sabotaging his foreign policy. Quite a few Jews were actually sent to Palestine, but finally the British threatened to sink the passenger boats, and they put diplomatic pressure on Hitler to stop the immigration. This attitude on the part of the British went on even during the war. There was a plan on the part of the SS to ship all the Jews in the camp system to Palestine, or wherever someone would take them, but the British blocked this right along. One of them said something about no one wanting that many Polish Jews. They might have taken a few hundred German Jews or Danish Jews, but not several hundred thousand Polish Jews. Of course, after the war was over, the British cried louder than anyone else about these poor Jews, most of whom had fled to Palestine. I was actually in charge of the main office for the immigration of Jews from the beginning of 1939 until about October that year, so I know exactly what I'm talking about. I finally saw that I could do nothing at all against such opposition, so I managed to find someone else to run the office and left it. Gestapo Chief, page 74. The first footnote read, 
Lord Moyne, British High Commissioner in Cairo, when the Jewish terrorist Stern Gang got wind of his blockage of the release of the Jewish camp inmates, they assassinated him. The second footnote read, Muller turned this over to Adolf Eichmann, who served under him. The Nazis started gassing people in the camps because the other choice was to let them starve since the Russians were not surrendering and the Germans were running out of food, and it took over ten minutes for the people in the gas chambers to die. The crematorium were designed to burn two bodies at a time, but the people being burned in them were so starved that four of them would fit inside, and Auschwitz was burning eighteen people per hour, but they simply couldn't keep up. The crematorium, the crematoria, were the same as those designed to operate in any medical facility, not built for purposeful extermination, and the sheer number of corpses became an insurmountable challenge, and Hitler had seen the world fail to respond when Turkey killed most of the Armenians in the summer of 1915 and he believed there would be a minimal response to the disposing of criminals and Jews, and to a large extent he had been right. <clears throat> Jews had been told to leave Germany, and were then called criminals and traitors for deserting the homeland, and it did not take long for the whole thing to spiral out of control, as human nature did indeed take its course. As the exterminations increased, the campers turned to hoping that the Germans would win the war so they would be allowed to live, since it was certain they would all be murdered if the Germans lost, so as to not leave any witnesses, and the slave laborers had proven their worth and knew the Germans would want to keep them, and so sabotage became even more rare in the work camps as the inmates acted as their own police. By the time Hitler had attacked Russia in Barbarossa, immigration had slowed to a crawl because people had just stopped trying to go anywhere, with the Eisensgruppen machine-gunning people in the woods after herding them out of small towns, and it was just not a good idea to travel. People just hunkered down and tried to be invisible, and anybody willing or able to move had already gone before fleeing Germany had become illegal. While many Jews had left Germany, more had stayed to prove the Nazis wrong about them, while sacrificing their poor eastern cousins in Poland had been seen as a necessary evil in satisfying the demand for alien-looking Jews while keeping their own privilege of German citizenship. One-third of German Jews stayed in Germany, and most of them would die. Hitler had been calling the Russians weak, so Stalin tried to show the world that he was tough and strong, and that show of ruthlessness made many Russians welcome the Germans as liberators. The German army had thought Russia would be a pushover after Russians had quit in the middle of the Great War, and the Germans were actually welcomed with open arms into the motherland at first in the summer of 1941, seen as liberators from Stalin's harsh demands. But when the SS Eisensgruppen began shooting their beloved Jewish commissars, the Russians had turned against the German invaders. Added to that confusion, the German army was slowed down, having to wait for the SS Eisensgruppen to catch up, and then it started to snow. Hitler sent an additional half a million soldiers in September of 1942 to take Stalingrad, and it took only a few months to kill 300,000 of them, while the rest were swallowed up as prisoners, and there had been a lull in deportations that summer in 1942 as the fight against Russia had taken priority, and at that time 80% of Jews in the camps were still alive and 20% had died and after the defeat at Stalingrad, those figures would reverse. There had been a Polish King Casimir with a Jewish girlfriend, who'd invited all the Jews kicked out of Spain in 1492 to come to Poland. And with Stalin as an ally, Hitler did not think Britain would declare war until at least 1943, and certainly not over Poland. Once upon a time, Poland had gone from the Baltic Sea all the way to the Crimea, and had stretched west to include Brandenburg, 
and deep in the foothills to the north of the Carpathian Mountains in the lovely Bohemian Forest, just upriver from Polish Silesia, the Moravians had been given refuge by in Folnik by the Polish king. On May 26, 1700, was born Nicholas Ludwig, Count von Zinzendorf, son of the Chamberlain and State Minister of Augustus II, Elector of Saxony and King of Poland. Having met with a Moravian refugee who told him of the persecutions to which his sect was exposed in Austria, Count Zinzendorf offered him and his co-religionists an asylum on his estate. The man, whose name was David, 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 accepted the offer and in 1722 settled with three other men at a place called by Zinzendorf Hernhut, the Lord's Guard. The Standard Dictionary of Facts, History, Language, Literature, Biography, Geography, Travel, Art, Government, Politics, Industry, Invention, Commerce, Science, Education, Natural History, Statistics, and Miscellany, a practical handbook of ready reference based upon everyday needs by Henry W. Ruoff, Buffalo, Frontier Press Company, 1919, page 717 and 18. These Moravians were a branch of the Hussites, who were the followers of John Huss, and they went to war when he died in, quote, the fiercest and most sanguinary civil wars ever known, close quote, the Standard Dictionary of Facts, page 119. Sanguinary meant either, one, involving death or bloodshed, two, bloodthirsty or eager to kill, three, consisting of or stained with blood, from the Encarta World English Dictionary, copyright 1999, Microsoft Corporation, from 1320 to the reign of Sigismund III, 1587 to 1632, the capital of Poland had been at Krakow, and then it was moved to Warsaw, and Auschwitz was 40 miles west of Krakow. In Bohemia, the Hussites had grown strong, and they took the field under Ziska, 1418, gained the Battle of Prague, July 14, 1420, and nearly annihilated the imperialist at Deutschbrod, January 8, 1422. After occupying the whole of Bohemia and Moravia, they threatened Vienna and in 1426 gained the victories of Ossig and Mies. The Empress Sigismund was at length too glad to come to terms with the Hussites, and the Treaty of Iglau in 1436 terminated hostilities between Catholic and Protestant for the time being. The Standard Dictionary of Facts, Ibid. When the Hundred Years' War ended seventeen years later in 1453, the Diet of Petrikin gave Poland independence except for a little piece of land kept in private hands up the Vistula River in Silesia, and the following year the Teutonic Order attacked Poland, and the Thorn Treaty of 1466 settled the Polish conquest of western Prussia. The Polish Count Zinzendorf, born in 1700, would go to London in 1737, and he traveled extensively back and forth from America to London until his death in 1760, and the War of the Polish Succession in 1733 had divided Silesia away from Poland. As the German army swiftly overran Poland, in the fall of 1939, refugees from the fighting, both Jewish and Gentile, fled toward the Russian border. The Russians were suspicious of anyone arriving from the West and would arrest the refugees, sending many of them to Siberia to work in the logging camps. Can the Germans come this far, Max? No, we're thousands of miles away. Stop worrying. In Siberia, it is very cold by Lester Goldberg, New York, Debner Books, 1987, page 11. If we choose a Jew to give out the bread and dole out the cup of water for each person, he could never resist the women asking for more for their children. The pole just waves them off and continues cutting the black loaves. In Siberia, it is very cold, page 9 and 10. 
Shortly after the Germans invaded Russia in June 1941, the Polish government in exile in London signed an agreement with the Soviet Union that freed all Polish nationals. In Siberia, it is very cold, page 7. Only 100,000 people had left Germany by the beginning of 1938, and they were those who had enough money to travel. And when they arrived at a new place, people would wonder why they hadn't been allowed to stay in Germany, and would begin to suspect that perhaps they were criminals after all. Only 500 Jews had come to America in 1933 when the quota was over 25,000, and some Jews who left Germany turned around and went right back. Hollywood Jews in the movie-making business had come from Poland and Russia and Germany and had been speaking out against Hitler until Joe Kennedy came out to California and told them to knock it off because he thought that Americans would blame Hollywood Jews if America had to go to war with Germany, and the Hollywood Jews took his advice and shut up about Hitler. As soon as Germany ran out of German Jews to plunder, the economy began to falter, and the decline could no longer be blamed on the parasitic German Jews bleeding Germany dry, so it had to be that the blood-sucking Jews were now sabotaging Germany from outside its borders, where they had fled with their secreted wealth. Consequently, Hitler set his sights on Jews living in France, but the French Jews turned out to be as disappointing as all the others in terms of coughing up money. Things were getting worse in Germany because countless doctors and lawyers and businessmen had been driven out of the fatherland, and the idea that Jews had sent their wealth to Russia appeared to be the answer, since the Jews in Austria had not coughed up much wealth either, so they all must have been shipping their gold to the east. The resistance groups and partisan fighters were invariably led by Jews still active as community organizers for the communist revolutions, and their agitating against the government brought harsh reprisals, and in the spring of 1942, the clever Germans built mobile gas chambers to deal with them so the trains could be freed up for use by the military. As the German army marched forward into Russia, the plundering of Soviet Jews proved no more profitable than in the other countries, so Hitler wondered if perhaps the Jews had sent their gold to the Pope in Rome for safe storage. The Italians had been former German subjects in the previous Reich, and when the British told the Germans that the Americans were landing in Italy, German soldiers understood this to mean that the Americans knew about the hidden Jewish treasure in Rome, and Germans dedicated their last breath to stopping the Americans from finding that Jewish gold in the Vatican before the Germans could send it home to Hitler. This was where the Jews must have hidden all their Jewish wealth, right under the Pope's nose. It had to be, because the Italians had been allowed to put Jews into camps without deporting them, and so the Germans started shipping Italian Jews to Auschwitz for interrogation purposes as soon as the Americans beat the British into Rome. The Nazis never did find the Pope's gold, and not for want of trying, and the tragedy of not finding the Vatican's gold would be the turning point of the war. And as the Americans proved to be unstoppable, Blame shifted to that Jew Morgenthau and the rest of the Jews running America, and many more people began calling FDR's economic plan the Jew Deal. As the war continued, Eichmann's boss Heydrich was assassinated in May of 1942, and the camps evolved into extermination centers as no country was willing to accept any of the Jews being shipped off to the camps where it was supposed that they were being given some honest work for a change. Great Britain was especially disinclined to accept them, and Heydrich had told Eichmann all about the British plot to kill Hitler in Munich back on the 8th of November in 1939 with the two British spies on the Dutch border that was called the Venlo Incident. Eichmann and the Zionists got along really well and had a common enemy in the British, 
who were opposed to Jews settling in Israel. And in the Nazi government in Germany, there were two sides to the division to which Eichmann belonged, one side dealing with sects or organized churches that included Freemasons and Jesuits, and the other department was responsible for hunting down communists and liberals, or the worldwide international Jew. Eichmann chose the former, where he could be in contact with his friends in the Zionist movement, and Archbishop Pacelli had staunchly opposed communism, not merely because it was anti-Christian, but because it challenged the power of the church by considering the state to be above God. So the original Nazis cooperated with the churches, but as the church people began to complain about the treatment of Jews, the Nazis turned against the church. In Yugoslavia, 5,000 Jews had joined the Chetniks to fight both the communists and the Nazis, and Britain forced the Americans to stop supporting the Chetniks at the Tehran Conference in 1943, and while these Jews were fighting alongside the Chetniks, their wives and children were being killed in gassing vans in Serbia. Not only Jews, but brain-damaged soldiers went into the gas chambers, and then less seriously wounded soldiers started disappearing, and when German people began asking too many questions, that's when the secrecy started up. It could have been kept secret longer if those involved weren't in the habit of getting drunk and bragging in the beer halls, but it didn't matter because nobody was terribly offended by their work. The Jews Eichmann was sending to be exterminated were those who did not want to move to Palestine, and when some in the foreign press accused the Germans of deliberately starving prisoners to death, they were told that there was simply not enough food because of the war and blamed the enemy for having bombed the supply trains. The starving people in the camps at the end of the war were not such a big surprise because there were plenty of starving people all around in those days, since the science and technology of food preservation had yet to emerge very far, not to mention the omnipresent food and waterborne diseases. It did not take long for fleeing people to starve because food was mostly on the hoof or growing in the fields, and the idea had naturally evolved that it was morally superior to kill the migrant Jews than to let them starve, and so while it had not been the initial intention to murder all the Jews, it simply happened to be the best thing that the Germans could do for them. The army needed trains for carrying troops and supplies and munitions, so transporting more and more Jews to the work camps to replace the ones dying of typhus had been interfering with the war effort, and the overcrowded camps were turning trainloads of prisoners away, so there seemed to be no other solution than to submit the overflow prisoners to mercy killing, but it had not been a straightforward conclusion. Zyklon B was for the killing of lice omnipresent in the unwashed travelers, and one day the German emptying the can into the delousing chamber had slipped and the whole can of Zyklon B went in, and while the result was tragic, one German thought it was just what Germany needed and he told the other Germans to gather some sick prisoners together and put them in the disinfectant chamber, disinfection chamber, and after several experiments, they figured out how many cans would kill a whole room full of people, and the final solution was born. As people were disposed of and then incinerated in the scientific concentration camps, more room opened up for more victims whose bank accounts and home equity went directly into the Reich treasury. And Hitler was able to spend more and more state money improving the lives of ordinary Germans. Hitler had built the Autobahn right away, and the same thing had been going on in America, putting state money to good use. And this was not capitalism, but something like industrial socialism, and it was not considered communism in, in America, as long as there remained an upper class and a middle class and a working class, along with an entire class of domestic servants. No profit 
was being made in building the Audubon or in the enterprises of the CCC, including the construction of the Hoover Dam. And without the profit motive, that meant that the incentive to streamline costs was gone, and those abusing the privilege of working for the state by lining their own pockets in Germany found it not just a reason to be fired, but a criminal offense that got them sent off to a processing center and thence to a concentration camp. So many Nazis were making money on the resettlement of Jews, getting them to pay for waivers or exceptions to deportation orders, then turning them in to get deported anyway, that Eichmann's efficiency was interfering with their profits, so his work was often sabotaged and interfered with. Not only were his men being frequently fired or murdered, but his superiors were constantly being replaced. Eichmann had to obtain clearance from the army if the trains entered a theater of war. The army could veto transports. What Dieter Wieslisena did not tell, and what is perhaps more interesting, is that the army used its right of veto only in the initial years when German troops were on the offensive. In 1944, when the deportations from Hungary clogged the lines of retreat for the whole for whole German armies in desperate flight, no vetoes were forthcoming. Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil by Hannah Arendt, New York Penguin Books, 1963-1984, page 213. Shipments of prisoners were loaded and unloaded in a never-ending effort to make the camp system work, and people suffered epidemics of disease as well as lack of food and clothes and water, and instead of becoming useful as factories, the camp struggled to simply store people until orders would arrive to move them someplace else. As the war went on and on, the situation in the concentration camps went from bad to worse, and Hitler would spend hours on the phone trying to make the camps more effective and efficient because National Socialism depended on their success. The labor camps were not just for manufacturing materials and munitions for Germany, but were supposed to be resettlement centers where people from outside Germany could be brought in and assimilated so that they could contribute to the culture and economy of the Reich. The camps were mismanaged, but it had become something more like official policy to actually make the inmates suffer, either as an incentive to work harder or as a warning to traitors to the fatherland that punitive measures could be taken against them. The bad manage management was done more from a hope that other countries would step in to offer the prisoners refuge, refuge preferably at a good price and then releasing them would advertise to the world how beneficent, beneficent and generous was the government of Germany. The U.S. had a policy of not accepting immigrants who were likely to become a public charge, and as the Nazi government squeezed the last drop of wealth out of Jews, they became increasingly more likely to need financial assistance if brought over to America. The war was cutting American resources to the bone, and FDR refused to pay ransom for Jewish lives because he needed to win the war and thought that Germany would only use the money to ratchet up the fighting against Americans. People wonder why the Germans didn't just give up when it became clear as day that they were going to lose and lose big, and the last year of the war was not simply insanity, but could be understood in knowing that the order that came down from Hitler in the f Himmler in the fall of 1944 to stop the mass murder of Jews was not only because the Americans were winning, but because FDR had been re-elected and he was a friend of Stalin, and Himmler's order to stop the gas chambers was because Hitler was to be blamed for all the Jew murdering, while Himmler was to be hailed as the hero who had stopped the Holocaust. The Germans took all the people from the concentration camps and made them march around in circles all over the country, partly to show the German people that the guards were still in charge as they directed the starving people to march through the German towns, 
and also because the camp guards had been given orders to take the prisoners somewhere, and all the orders were different and constantly changing, so big groups of skeleton people would walk around for weeks at gunpoint, only to end up somewhere that another group had just left, and then they would hit the road again and keep going someplace else, only to be told there was no room and get commands to go to a new destination while many were left behind dead in ditches. The Germans had always been so precise and careful, while these death marches in the last year of the war were confusing and pointless, and the orders must have been burned because no records were left behind to give any clues, and that final year of the war should have allowed prisoners to escape. But nobody got away as they marched around the countryside, while the local vi vi villagers shouted cruel things and spit at the walking skeletons and refused to bring them food or clothing. The cold hard truth was that in the last year of the war in Germany, an escaped prisoner would have found no help from Germans, not just from the brainwashing they had received, but because there was nobody left with any resources to spare in the true nightmare that was what it was to have become losers. Simon Wiesenthal said he survived for so long at the end because the SS needed camp prisoners to guard so they wouldn't be sent to the Eastern Front to fight Russians, and that they had slowed down the exterminations for that reason, even before the orders had come down from Himmler to close the camps in the fall of 1944. The Americans would have the camp prisoners walk past rows of people to pick out the SS guards, and while some of the guards were beaten to death right away at Dachau by liberated prisoners, over 100 out of the guards were taken out and shot against a wall by Americans. After the war, the Germans thought that the lack of prosecutions for Nazis proved their point that non-Germans were weak after all, just like all those incarcerated Jews who didn't fight back. Before Hitler's war, there were three million Jews in Poland and three million Jews in Russia and 300,000 in the Baltic countries. And in the summer of 1941, well before things had begun to get bad in Germany, 200,000 people had died in mass shootings in the forests around Polish and Russian villages, and when the Americans marched in four years later, there were 30,000 unburied bodies left in the camps, dead people just laying around in big piles. <clears throat> if now someone were to ask me, do you repent for having been a National Socialist? I must answer no. I repent that my faith was misused on behalf of an evil cause. I repent every unexpiable crime committed in my and my comrade's name. I repent that the faith and unheard of self-sacrifice and devotion of German workers was betrayed by Hitler, but I do not repent, having loved my people above everything, that I rendered every sacrifice that I believed and hoped. In a French author I read a formula that consoled me. It is finer and better ardently to serve a great error than pettily to drudge for a petty truth. The Nazi Revolution, page 91. The people of Germany whom we saw and with whom we talked were sullenly unfriendly or obsequiously servile. Their acquiescence to our authority was only outward. There was no doubt that Nazi cells flourished. The martial spirit was not dimmed. The war had been lost through error. In the next war, many hastened to tell me, Germany would not make the basic mistake of antagonizing the Jews of the world. Behind the Silken Curtain, page 104. The Allies had continued to refuse to bomb the railroad tracks leading into the death camps by insisting that they had more important targets. But the truth was that the British needed the railroads intact in order to fight the Russians and had been fastidious about picking targets that ensured the railway lines would keep functioning. When Ike marched the German townspeople right into the concentration camps to show them what had become of National Socialism, 
The German faces caught on film showed only townsfolk disgusted with the occupying forces for putting them through this ordeal and for forcing them to have to look at all these dead people. The townspeople are guardedly indignant in these films, looking at the camera operators as though they were puppets unknowingly caught up in the Jewish conspiracy. There were reports of American soldiers mistreating Jews, and nobody knew if these stories were made up by Germans or by Americans sympathizing with the Nazis, and the U.S. government said they could not handle the amount of Jews who had survived the camps because in America there were already more than enough Jews, and there was still sympathy for Germany in America, where there were more Germans than any other ethnic group. <clears throat> During the 1930s, the New York Police Department faced a whole new set of problems in law enforcement. Nothing in the civil service studies had pre prepared us for this particular kind of violence that was to stalk the streets. Political violence. Political violence. To try and cope with this new development, the department created the Undercover Squad. Members of this squad joined the German-American Bund, the Christian Front, and the Communist Party, then fed intelligence reports to the department. This was necessary and helpful, but in the final analysis, the question of peace in the streets had to be solved by the local precinct precinct commanders and their staffs, and it soon became clear to me that the only way to keep these fanatics from terrorizing the city was by liberal use of the nightstick. LaGuardia was mayor of New York during most of this period, and it seemed to some of us cops that he spent most of his time conducting official investigations into alleged quote-unquote police brutality. It wasn't that LaGuardia was sympathetic to any political lunatic fringe, I think that he just didn't like cops very much. Certainly he didn't understand the problem we had on the streets. The Kind of Guy I Am by Robert McAllister with Floyd Miller, New York, Popular Library, McGraw-Hill, 1957-1958, page 194 and 5. Now, it may be a perfectly peaceful meeting, and in that case we got to let it run, but if the speakers begin to call for blood, incite to riot, we got to break it up. We'll break it up, all right, Captain, I said. Let me make this clear, Bob. I want the meeting dispersed. I don't want to fight if we can avoid it. Proceed along those lines. One more thing, Captain. News of this meeting is going to get around the neighborhood. I know what you mean. The Jews have taken a lot and are getting restless. Go and talk to them. Convince them it's for their own good to let the police department handle this. Yes, sir, I said. For the rest of that week, I called on the rabbis and the social and business leaders. I admitted to them, quite frankly, that there were times when it looked like the department wasn't doing enough against the mobs, but I promised them it would be different this time. I won their support, and they promised that on this Saturday night they'd keep their people off the streets and away from the meeting. I was pleased by their confidence in me, of course, but there was still a large group of Jews not bound by this agreement, the Jewish gangsters. There was a key man in the precinct, a goniff named Little Izzy. He'd been part of the row mob until the syndicate took over and was now a runner for Luciano. He sneered at me, Luciano. He sneered at me, you cops protecting them bastards. We're not protecting them. We're going to collar them Saturday, but we can't do the job if your mob shows up and starts a riot. My people took plenty from them. Look what's happening in Germany. What they're doing to my people there. It ain't going to happen in the Bronx. Not without a fight, he grinned. Okay, McAllister, it's your show. But after Saturday, I ain't promising anything. After Saturday, things may be different. The mob began to collect on the corner at about 8 o'clock. It was surly, sadistic. It was bent on trouble. The mood was apparent at once. Let the gutters of New York run red with the blood of the Jew, Hardery screamed. His words were almost drowned by the mob's hysterical cries. At this moment, Captain Collins jumped up to the speaker's platform, pushed Hardery away from the mic, and held up his arms for silence. He announced, The speaker is violating the statutes of the state of New York by inciting to riot. This meeting is therefore illegal and ordered adjourned. Please disperse quietly. 
There was a moment of stunned silence. Then a low, nasty rumble began to rise, like thunder after a flash of lightning. Then before my eyes, Captain Collins disappeared. Hands reached out to grab his ankles and jerk him down from the platform. He was beneath the feet of the mob. <clears throat> There was an explosion inside my skull. Somebody had hit me with a lead pipe, and my knees went weak, and I began to sink to the pavement. I knew what fate awaited me there. I forced myself back upwards, flailing with my club. After a moment of blindness, my vision cleared, and in the grip of an icy rage, I went after my attackers. Within ten minutes, the mob had been driven west on 141st Street and dispersed. I directed first aid and removal of the wounded, but there were many who crawled off into the night, preferring to nurse their wounds rather than face arrest. We had the ringleaders. I had seen to that. The mob is reforming, Captain. Where? Collins snapped. 139th Street. They've lit torches and are marching. Follow them as long as they keep on the move and don't molest anybody. Let them march. Radio back their position every three minutes. We didn't have to wait long. My God, Captain, they've laid siege to the station house. They've filled the entire block from curb to curb. They're waving their torches and shouting how they're going to take the prisoners away from us when we bring them in. I jumped into the white-topped police car and ordered the driver to the station house. As we approached the block in 138th Street, I saw the mob jammed solid, shouting and waving torches. As our car came into view, they set up a scream of hate. I said to the driver, Turn on the siren and drive into them. His hands, knuckles white, gripped the wheel. You mean, I mean that if they don't get out of the way, run them down. I repeated the order, Run them down. The banshee cry of the siren split the night, and with a clash of gears we drove down upon the mob. They held for a moment, thinking we'd stop. They shook their fists, their clubs, their faces distorted by torchlight into something animal. They were beyond my understanding, beyond my pity or my hate. I felt only a deep revulsion as for something straight from hell. I cried hoarsely, if they don't open up, run them down. They broke at the last moment. For some it was too late, and our fenders caught bodies, sending them reeling and crying in anguish. We skidded to a stop at the station house steps. I sprang to the top of them, my gun drawn. I turned to face the mob. The first man who puts a foot on these steps gets a bullet right in the gut, I shouted. Captain Collins' car and the wagon with the prisoners had followed through the open lane and now pulled to a stop. The prisoners were herded out of the wagon and into the station house, and not a member of the mob dared raise a hand. There followed the usual charges of police brutality and the usual LaGuardia investigation. The important thing is that the men we had arrested went to jail, and the back of the fascist mov movement in the Bronx was broken. Never again did they dare to go hunting for Jewish blood. The kind of guy I am, page 201 through 8. Typical of our trouble with the communists was the long and bitter strike at the National Urn Bag Company. We had received word from Captain Donnelly's undercover squad that this strike was to be led by the Communist Party and was considered extremely important. As the strike dragged on for week after week, enough employees reported for work to keep the plant in operation, and the communist newspaper Daily Worker became shrill in its abuse of the police. We were, quote, fascist troops at the command of Wall Street imperialists, close quote. We were, quote, labor haters who want to turn the nation into a concentration camp, close quote. Then came a tip from the undercover squad that on Monday the picket line was to be reinforced even more and that it was going to charge the plant and wreck the machinery. Monday morning, the picket line swelled in size and took on an ugly mood. With chilling animal cries, they came at us. I rallied my reserves for a last-ditch stand in front of the entrance. Then they were upon us. The entire street was a wild melee, melee of fighting men. Melee, melee, melee of fighting men.
but this particular communist was deadly calm and purposeful. He made directly for my captain, and before Johnny Collins quite knew what was happening, he raked him with a vicious left hook on the temple. Collins staggered backward, fell to one knee, then came raging back to drive the communist into the wall with a flurry of b blows. At this point, a daily worker photographer appeared out of nowhere to snap a picture of a uniformed police captain slugging a quote-unquote helpless and innocent worker. I lunged forward and brought my nightstick down on the camera, knocking it to the ground. It was immediately destroyed by the mob. Then I rallied my remaining men, and inch by bloody inch we drove the rioters back across the street and reformed our line to hold them there. We captured about ten of the leaders. The kind of guy I am. Page 196 and 7. At the other end of the political spectrum were native fascists, and if their avowed goal was different from the communists, their methods were much the same, and when the time came for us to take on the fascists, I faced one of the most difficult jobs of my life. Many of these fascist fanatics were of my own ancestry and religion, Irish Catholic, and I was mightily ashamed of them. Ashamed is a mild word for what I felt. I was outraged. The Bronx was a hotbed of fascist agitation under a variety of labels. The Coughlinites, the Coglinites, and the Christian mobilizers began a campaign against Jewish merchants in the area, marching and shouting the slogan, Buy Christian! They concentrated a picket line in front of Sachs Quality Furniture Store on 3rd Avenue, trying to drive that concern out of business. I carried out my orders to the letter. The pickets were allowed to march and shout against the Jews. They were allowed to distribute copies of social justice which charged that Jews were communists and engaged in a conspiracy to take over the world. They were allowed to demonstrate to their heart's content, but I saw to it that, that they didn't lay a hand on a single customer who wanted to enter that store. There are times when the strict enforcement of the letter of the law does not prevent the spirit of the law from being violated. This was such a time. The mere presence of the picket line had a disastrous effect upon Sachs's business, Jewish customers in particular staying away from the store in order to avoid unpleasantness. This success spurred on the anti-Semites, and picket lines began to appear all over the South Bronx. By observing the letter of the law, we cops hadn't kept the peace. We had allowed disorder to spread. The kind of guy I am. Page 198 and 200. <clears throat> the name came from the leather shoe of the peasant. The long thong with which it was laced was called a boond. The word had a double meaning because a boond was also an association, a covenant. Here I stand, A Life of Martin Luther, by Roland H. Bainton, New York, a mentor book, The New American Library, 1950-1961, page 209. Before the 20th of July assassination attempt, 1,600 Germans had been dying every day. And after the 20th of July, 16,000 would die every day. And in his final week, Hitler was told that he could surrender to the Americans, but he'd come to understand that the Americans were not interested in stopping Stalin, especially because of FDR's Communist New Deal. Hitler ordered General Wenck and... General Steiner to hold back the Russians until Himmler's separate peace could be made. And there was also the possibility of the miracle of Goering convincing the Americans in Austria to join in the fight against Russia, but Steiner's army melted away, and Wenck was the only one left with his twelfth army. And in German, Weichen means to yield, to give up. And on that last day, a German officer named Don Darton Fuhrer de Grell escaped from Berlin in a Volkswagen fueled by potato schnapps. Three million Germans were missing in action, and a half million Germans had died in the Battle of Berlin alone. And FDR had not helped Stalin from some manifestation of social New Dealism, but because Hitler had designs on giving the American Southwest back to Mexico if they had agreed to help Germany. And FDR also backed Stalin because the British wanted to put Otto back on the throne in Austria, 
and put Juan back on the throne in Spain, and put Umberto back on the throne as the king of Italy. The major war criminals would be put on trial at Nuremberg in November of 1945, and a dozen other prosecutions were held in the major concentration camps and the Nuremberg trials produced death sentences that were quickly carried out before any insurgency could break them out of jail. And in the end, only twelve Nazis hung for war crimes, seven went to jail, and three were allowed to walk free. But although the bad faith of the defendants was manifest, the only ground on which guilty conscience could actually be proved was the fact that the Nazis, and especially the criminal organizations to which Eichmann belonged, had been so very busy destroying the evidence of their crimes during the last months of the war. And this ground was rather shaky. It proved no more than recognition that the law of mass murder, because of its novelty, was not yet accepted by other nations, or, in the language of the Nazis, that they had lost their fight to quote-unquote liberate mankind from the rule of subhumans, especially from the domination of the elders of Zion, or, in ordinary language, it proved no more than the admission of defeat. Would any one of them have suffered from a guilty conscience if they had won? Eichmann in Jerusalem, page 276 and 7. After 32,000 SS had been put in prison at Dachau, the lion's share had to be released shortly thereafter to help rebuild Germany, and houses formerly seized from Jews were still occupied and being used by the new owners, even with bloodstains still on the walls. After the fall of the Nazis, Jews in Europe continued to die at the hands of Poles and Germans and Lithuanians and many others, and when Jews came out of hiding when the war was over, they were murdered by the locals anyway, and non-Jews continued to desecrate Jewish cemeteries, stealing the headstones and stone structures to use as building material. There had been 600,000 Jews in Germany before the war, and 125,000 of them were still alive when Hitler died, and after the war, over 90,000 of these left Germany, while the Jews remaining in the fatherland would not have been enough to populate a small American town, and they were still in danger for their very lives. Only a few days ago, a friend recognized in the Department of Police nine men who had belonged to a Nazi extermination squad in Poland, which murdered 12,000 Jews. These murderers were wearing police uniforms, moving among the population. Do you wonder we cannot bear to stay here? Behind the Silken Curtain, page 136. I told him, Michael Cardinal, Michael Cardinal Fowl. Haber. Frankly, that what had distressed me so deeply during the war was that Nazi excesses were greater in Catholic Bavaria than anywhere else in Germany. Behind the Silken Curtain, page 104. A Germany without Jews, he went on, was unthinkable. We must have Jews in Germany, he said. Jews have the same right to live in Germany as I, having been born in Germany, have a right to live here. They likewise have a right to live in peace here. He had hoped, he said, to see Germany's great Jewish doctors return, and he expressed his astonishment that, as far as he could determine, only one German Jewish physician had come back. It was apparent that his eminence did not know that the reason they had not returned was because they had virtually all been murdered. He had no idea of the tragic extent of the mass murder of European Jewry. The attitude of the aged German porter who took my bags at the hotel in Nuremberg also would have helped the cardinal to understand Jewish fears. Who were the American gentlemen, he wanted to know. I said we were part of a committee investigating the condition of Jews in Germany. The old man, who had been all amiability and obsequiousness, turned red with almost maniacal rage. He spat out, They should all be killed. We want none of them. Behind the Silken Curtain, page 106. We were lunching one day with General Mark Clark, the American commander in Austria, at his villa on Vienna's outskirts. Several hundred Jews came from the Rothschild Hospital where they 
carried banners reading, Open the Gates of Palestine. An elderly Viennese gentleman, soberly dressed, with discreet black hat, muffler, and gloves, looked on curiously. He turned to an American newspaper correspondent who stood near him and asked, What is this? Who are these people? The reporter said, This is a demonstration. These people are Jews, and they wish to go to Palestine. The old gentleman drew himself up indignantly. Well, let them, he snapped. Did they not cause all this? And he gestured with his arm, a wide, all-embracing sweep, taking in all of ruined Vienna, the roofless buildings, the rubble, the misery, the devastation, behind the silken curtain, page 135. An Austrian officer had led the gang that took Anne Frank's family away on the 4th of August in 1944 and they had been betrayed by a dutchman and the american president asked if the brit asked the british if one hundred thousand jewish displaced people could be allowed into palestine since there was plenty of room there and palestine was a desert anyway it was part of a long-range program to reforest land which the crusaders the turks and napoleon's army among them had denuded and which had remained neglected ever since Behind the Silken Curtain, page 204. The Jews in Palestine had created a Jordan Valley Authority, JVA, based on the TVA in America that could generate electricity where the Jordan Valley dropped 1,300 feet below sea level a short distance from the Mediterranean Sea, and a 20-mile canal could be cut to the Jordan River and used for power and the water above the tunnel could be used for irrigation to make the desert bloom. In Washington and London and Cairo and Jerusalem, hearings were held for four months to look at the problem of Jews wanting to go to Palestine, and what might be done to allow Jews to con continue living in Europe. The Americans asked a judge named Joe from Houston to hold hearings concerning the Holy Land, and the author of Behind the Silken Cur Curtain almost wasn't included, even though the American president insisted three times that he be invited, but the people running the hearings objected to his views on free speech and his past work trying to make it possible for Americans whose ancestors had been slaves to find employment with Southern railroads. The first person on the witness stand was the dean of the law school at the University of Pennsylvania, who, quote, had come to Germany believing it desirable to rehabilitate the victims of Nazism on German soil. But after he had seen the situation, it was evident to anyone who wanted to hear, to anyone who wanted to see, that no Jew facing the bitter realities of his position would dream of remaining in Central and Eastern Europe, close quote, behind the Silken Curtain, page 141. The U.S. State Department gave the hearings for four months, gave the hearings four months to come up with a plan, quote, to demonstrate that Great Britain and the United States can together solve the problems before them, close quote. The contrast between our two chairmen, one British and one American, was marked, marked, marked. This was amusingly shown one afternoon when we paid a courtesy visit to members of the United States Supreme Court. As our committee walked into the, the enormous building, we were greeted solemnly, solemnly by guards and escorted in dignified silence down what seemed interminably long marble cor corridors. It was an atmosphere in which one found oneself whispering. Suddenly, from an open door, boomed a great voice shouting, Where the hell are you, Texas Joe? It was then Chief Justice of the United States, the late Harlan Fisk Stone, looking for his old friend, the circuit judge from the West. Our British colleagues were rather taken aback at this exhibition of uninhibited American moors. It was difficult for them to envisage such a greeting between the Lord Chief Justice of England and a judge from the lower court. From then on I think they were surprised at nothing, not even when, in Vienna, at a dinner given by the American military, and after an orchestra had played a Texas song in honor of the judge, the latter suddenly threw back his head, opened his 
his mouth and emitted a rafter-shaking yippee behind the silken curtain, page 10 to 11. The British made life for the refugee Jews as unpleasant as possible, hoping they would get tired of living in refugee camps and go back to Germany, giving up on the idea of going to make a homeland in Palestine. The British in Austria sought to compel the Jews to rehabilitate themselves in Poland. The British position was based on Bevan's assumption that it would mean Hitler had won the war if the Jews left Europe behind the silken curtain. Page 138.